Well, welcome everyone to the Kupferberg Holocaust Resource Center and Archives. It's a pleasure to have you here. If it's any of your first visits, I hope you'll stay a little longer or come back and see our exhibits. Unfortunately, our permanent exhibit needs to go away for the sake of having this beautiful space, but please come back again and see it. Um, we have out on the back counter, if you haven't picked up, uh, a schedule of events of our other fall lectures and film screenings. So please grab one of those. And I want to just highlight for you one particular event that we have coming up on the evening of November 10th. Please, well, these will be handed to you as you leave, so please feel free to grab one. But uh, November 10th marks the anniversary of an event that was pivotal in the unfolding of the Holocaust um, called uh, the Night of Broken Glass or Kristallnacht. And we're having a really wonderful presentation with survivors of three genocides, three women who were all from 9 to 14 at the time that they experienced genocide. We have a survivor of the Holocaust, Hanny Liebman, a survivor of the Rwandan genocide, Jacqueline Murakateti, and a survivor of the Srebrenica genocide, Arisada Dudic. And they're all wonderful, powerful, and incredible speakers. And so I encourage you all to come visit us, grab the flyer so you can remember. But in general, the Kupferberg Holocaust Center exists to facilitate discussion about the about the lessons, we say, of genocide. But really, what that means is, what is it that we can learn from the past in order to change the world we live in today? And that's really what we strive for day after day here. We love having help and partners from students and staff and faculty, but primarily students. So come back and speak with us, engage with us. We have lots of ideas, and we have lots of opportunities for you. Um, but you are here today for the second lecture in this year's KHRCA colloquium series. Um, I hope that some of you had the opportunity to hear the first lecture. It was really remarkable and powerful and helped set out some of the definitional framework that the following lectures will be um, referring to. But uh, here to give you the real introduction to today's presentation, is Dr. Amy Traver. Thank you. So it's such a pleasure to see all of you here today, um, despite the rain, right? And uh, some of us have traveled quite far today to be here. Um, one of our speakers actually landed about an hour ago. And all of us know the traffic on the um, LIE and the Grand Central Parkway and all the different routes to get here. So we um, owe her and, of course, um, the other speaker today a lot of appreciation and thanks for being here. So um, as uh, Dr. Lashem has mentioned, my name is Amy Traver. I'm an associate professor professor of sociology and education here at Queensboro. It's a pleasure to see all of you today at the second event of our Kupferberg Holocaust uh, Resource Center and Archives uh, colloquia series titled Gender, Mass Violence, and Genocide. At our first event in the series, we heard from Dr. Alyssa von joden Forge, whose important research situates gender at the center of the analysis and prevention of genocidal processes. During her remarks, Dr. von joden Forge described rape and other forms of sexual violence violence as instruments of power, pre-planned or deliberate acts then, that can both signal genocidal intent and serve as a weapon of genocide. Dr. von joden Forge also introduced us to the ways in which Article 2 of the UN's 1948 Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide, as well as the work of Raphael Lemkin, the father of that convention, should be read to include crimes of rape and sexual violence. Today's event will build on this introduction. Please join me in welcoming to Queensborough Community College Dr. Natalie Nenadic and Professor Cynthia Suhu. Together they will discuss how mass rape came to be established as a war crime, crime against humanity, and crime of genocide. We'll hear first from Dr. Natalie Nenadic, an assistant professor of philosophy at the University of Kentucky, whose expertise lays in the 19th and 20th century continental philosophy, the philosophy of law, and human rights. With Asia Armanda, Dr. Nenadic named and conceptualized the crime of genocidal rape in their work with survivors of mass sexual atrocities in Bosnia, Herzegovina, and Croatia. 
Through this work and with the help of renowned attorney Catherine McKinnon, Dr. Nanadic helped to pioneer the crime's recognition under international law in a judicial venue created before the existence of the international criminal tribunals. Currently, Dr. Nanadic is completing a book tentatively titled The Imperative of Thinking After Auschwitz, The Genealogy of the Concept of Genocidal Rape. We'll then hear from Professor Cynthia Suhu, the director of the International Women's Human Rights Clinic at CUNY's Law School, and an expert in women's human rights and human rights advocacy in the United States. Prior to coming to CUNY, Professor Suhu was a director of the U.S. legal program at the Center for Reproductive Rights. In addition to managing U.S. litigation and state advocacy work, she spearheaded and supervised the development of the Center's U.S. human rights advocacy and fact-finding work. From 2001 to 2007, Professor Suhu was a director of the Bringing Human Rights Home Project of the Human Rights Institute at Columbia Law School. She's worked on U.S. human rights issues before U.N. human rights bodies, the Inter-American Commission for Human Rights, and in domestic courts. Today's events will obviously include all of you and your comments and questions, and we'll reserve them for after the speakers have uh, spoken to us. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to thank Amy Traver and the Kupferberg uh, Holocaust Research Center and Archive um, for organizing this wonderful event and for the invitation uh, to present on this topic. I've worked on it for as long as I can remember and um, for most of that time it was extremely difficult to get a space um, to hear about these atrocities and um, to talk about them in a way that was um, responsible to them. So I really commend the center in this particular program. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak about this. Um, so what I will talk about today is philosophy in a general way, its relationship to um, the topic of genocide, to getting genocide itself recognized as a crime, and its relationship to getting the sexual atrocity aspect of genocide um, recognized. So hopefully this will work here, let's see. All right, so a bit of the philosophical background. Um, so one way of thinking about philosophy's task, what philosophy does, is that it helps us understand aspects of the human condition that are usually hidden or not well known. And the way that it does this is through concretely grappling with, with how these, uh, these aspects of the human condition are experienced and through uh, looking at interdisciplinary sources of that human condition to come up with a bigger picture understanding of it. So the crime of genocide was mainly hidden and unknown before and during the time of the Holocaust. It, of course, has taken place across history in different ways, as Raphael Lemkin's uh, work uh, has shown, even prior to his efforts to get the Holocaust recognized as a genocide. Um, during um, the end of the 1930s, 1945, of course, it was being perpetrated throughout Europe in an unprecedented way, in a new way, um, but it had no official name, it was not recognized, so it required, among other disciplines, the participation of philosophical thinking to help clarify what it is, to bring it from the place, or the realm of being unknown to being visible and known and having a name and recognition in world awareness um, as well as in law. So, a major figure uh, who participated in this process is, of course, Hannah Arendt, um, a German Jewish uh, philosopher and uh, refugee to the United States. Um, and one of the major places where she reflects on the Holocaust is, of course, her famous work, Eichmann in Jerusalem, a report on the banality of evil. Um, she went as a philosopher journalist on behalf of the New Yorker to write reports uh, about this trial, of course, is an unprecedented trial. Um, uh, there was no forum to bring charges of genocide during this time, so he was brought to Jerusalem to st stand trial and to use the best legal mechanisms available to do something about a crime that at that point uh, had no other way of being tried except uh, through this way that uh, it was done in the Jerusalem court. Um, so, here I just want to summarize uh, her reflections on the Nuremberg trials and a little bit about the Eichmann trial, but the Nuremberg trials are significant here because she is addressing how, in spite of the fact that there was some recognition of an 
unprecedented crime having took place in Europe. The Nuremberg trial still did not do justice to this crime. It didn't come to recognize genocide explicitly. So it had this really ambivalent relationship to the crime of genocide. And it also goes to show how very difficult it is and how a long, difficult, arduous process it is to make new crimes known, bring them to world awareness, much less to get them um, prosecuted. Um, so there was some recognition that um, an unprecedented crime had, uh, had been perpetrated against the Jewish people and it needed some sort of reckoning. And of course, that is the crime that we would come to know as genocide. Um, genocides had taken place before in history, but there wasn't a name to give to those experiences. Um, but the Holocaust was different from these crimes um, in a number of ways. Of course, it was a genocide, um, but unlike other genocides, it aimed to have global reach. It aimed to go after the Jewish population globally, wherever, uh, wherever it could send its armies to go after the population. And it also had an unprecedented um, technological way of doing it. So it was done, of course, through, through gas chambers, through uh, this incredible industrial bureaucracy, train stations that could organize and move people from populations from different parts of Europe to the death camps in Poland. Um, so the aim of having global reach had the, the technological wherewithal at hand to actually accomplish this. Um, and so that the nature of this genocide which is different from other genocides in the past, also contributed to making genocide finally, to some extent, visible in the world consciousness. Um, and so the, the uh, Nuremberg trials were created in large part because there was such a recognition. Now, there was an ambivalent outcome of those trials, but it, it, there was a thrust to create them as a result of having recognized that something unprecedented had taken place. So um, this, was the, this was the challenge that these trials faced. You have something unprecedented taking place. How do you prosecute it? If law is, if you prosecute crimes based on existing law, things that law already understands, how do you prosecute something that's not in the law books? Um, so, the Nuremberg trials, it had a new category, this category called crimes against humanity that could have been used as a rubric under which to charge, uh, uh, prosecute the facts, the experiences of genocide, and as Han Arendt um, argues, they, they didn't um, um, rise to the challenge of the unprecedented to think of a way of talking about these new crimes that were not familiar, that were new, and, and um, uh, covering them in, in the Nuremberg verdict. Okay, so now I just wanna um, go through the difference between genocide and war crimes and, um, and then show how in fact the crime of genocide ended up in some sense concealed in the, in the Nuremberg verdicts. So this is, uh, basically a, a, a simplification of uh, Arendt's treatment of, of this in her analysis of the Nuremberg trial. So um, just you know, very generally, war crimes, that was a crime that was already on the books. So uh, law was familiar with it, lawyers were familiar with it. It was something you could tap. Um, and, and when you went to a war situation, those were the kind of crimes that you could recognize. And, and according to you know, what was familiar, you could go there, and, and that, that's what you can kind of pick out. You had that framework of war crimes, you see a war, then you can pick out the things that are already familiar. So what are war crimes? So excess, generally speaking, excesses in war that happen all, on all sides. Um, by those few people, the, the, the rogue elements, the bad apples on each side. Um, and those few bad apples, they, you know, an example of, of war crimes would be deliberately targeting civilians. They're not supposed to target um, civilians. Um, brutal, uh, excessive crimes, you know, cr br brutal, sadistic uh, treatment of civilians, of people who are not legitimate targets, but any kind of uh, gratuitous brutality. You have a war mission, you're supposed to accomplish your war mission, and anything beyond that um, that you do along these lines is considered a war crime. They don't happen very often. They are the exceptions to the way that 
uh, legitimate war is, con is, is conducted, and so they stand out. They're easy to pick out because they don't happen too often. Genocide, on the other hand, during this period, was a new, previously unknown crime that was happening in a context of war. Um, so unlike a war crime, genocide is the planned systematic destruction of an ethnic group. Its whole point is brutality, is a gratuitous brutality targeting civilians. Um, so that's not, you know, that behavior is not the exception. It's not uh, the work done by a few bad apples. It's the rule. Um, and in fact, the exceptions would be those few people who are in this kind of a war situation but refuse to participate in it. So it's, 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 uh, it's very different. So if, you, if this is what you've inherited legally and in the world in terms of your awareness of crimes, things that can go bad in a war, it's not, quite, it's not gonna fit what is happening in terms of these new uh, crimes. And this was the um, um, challenge presented to the Nuremberg trials and according to Arendt, um, one that they didn't meet so well. Okay, so what did they do? Well, they took this familiar crime of war crimes and applied it to these new facts. So uh, excessive brutality that happens on occasion by a few bad apples. Um, whereas the Holocaust was um, a, a planned systematic brutality where the whole point of it, not just the few exceptional bad apples were doing this, that's the whole point. The whole point was to go after civilians in this you know, horrific way. Um, so the trials misinterpreted genocide um, as if it were a war crime, so there was an, a misfit between the legal concept and, and the facts that were happening to the victims. So as she, as she states, it, en it ended up concealing or in some way um, covering up a cr the, the new crime that required a new concept and a new, th new thinking, so it required, it required philosophy, it required to reconceptualize based on this new set of facts, you know, how we understand crime within war. So in the end, they ended up not, um, not prosecuting um, uh, harms, egregious harms, abuses uh, that constitute genocide. And as she suggests, they were rather uncomfortable in kind of breaking new ground, going into this new unfamiliar territory and setting a precedent that would recognize something that at this time barely even had a name. It was, I mean, think even in her book, she uses it one or, one or two times. Um, so it wasn't widely known. So there was a, a conservative aspect to the court where they didn't you know, s step up and, and be responsible to the facts at hand as, as, as well as they could have been. So um, uh, next, I want to discuss very briefly the Eichmann trial. Um, it's a little bit too much to go into detail uh, right now, but what is relevant here is that she does, she analyzes some shortcomings of this trial, but the bottom line difference between the Nuremberg trials, what the Nuremberg trials accomplished and what the Eichmann trial accomplished was that um, the court in Jerusalem um, did not mix up war crimes, those few crimes by bad apples, with the crime of of the Holocaust. So she says here the main difference between the Jerusalem court, a court that uh, was looking at this atrocity against the Jewish people, and the Nuremberg trials is that the Jerusalem court did not fall into the trap of equating the Holocaust with ordinary war crimes. So it drew a very clear line there. So the difference here was between familiar crimes and unprecedented or not yet known crimes. Um, she said that at the Jerusalem court, there was enough of a distinction made so that that could serve as a precedent for future legal reckoning um, of, this, of this crime. So if there was a future legal forum, for instance, where you're bringing charges against perpetrators of the Holocaust or another genocide, the Jerusalem court could serve as a better legal precedent to be responsible to the facts of this crime than what had taken place at Nuremberg. Okay, so now um, a summary of the background, like the conceptual background that we had um, in going to events, as we moved to events in Europe um, in the 1990s. So at, the, at this point, um, there had been already a growing awareness of genocide, um, an awareness that did not exist at the actual time of the Holocaust. 
and immediately after it. So of course there was the genocide convention um, and you're well aware of you know, the components of it, what, what you know, counts as genocide and was recognized under the convention. And during this period you also had um, a lot of a scholarship on the Holocaust. Children of Holocaust survivors were writing what was happening. They were studying. There was, there was research, you know, serious research, scholarship, and knowledge about this so that we as a civilization became more aware of what this is. And one of Hannah Arendt's ideas is that um, a better, this better understanding of the specific genocide of the Holocaust could then serve as a way to help future victims. Her idea was that, well, if this crime had shown, it had shown itself in history for the first time, at least in this industrial way that it was done um, during the Holocaust, uh, it opened the door to it being more likely to be repeated. And for that reason, there was a need for recognition of it conceptually and legally in order to protect victims for, for law and other institutions to be there to protect victims in the way that it wasn't there to protect victims of the Holocaust. Okay, another um, conceptual resource sort of in the, in the back of, um, you know, it, as our intellectual inheritance is this recognition that rape does happen in war. And this was made um, um, more visible by Susan Brown Miller's book, this famous book, and I think it was published in 1975, Against Our uh, Will, Men, Women, and Rape. So within the feminist movement, which is now starting to address, at least in North America, issues of sexual violence, there was a recognition that that rape um, happens, happens in war. And the way that it was characterized in, in Brown Miller's book was that, well, you know, this is, what, this is men being men. It's, this is what happens in all wars. It happens on all sides. Um, this is something that we would come to challenge when we you know, took this concept and kind of checked it against the facts of, of, of sexual atrocities happening in genocide. But in any event, these were sort of the theoretical resources that we had as we were confronted with the philosophical task of how do we talk about these particular atrocities that are happening in this, in this context, atrocities that don't have a name, that are not known in law, so how do, you know, how do we wrap our heads around them? How, what do we call them? Okay, so now we have um, uh, these atrocities starting to happen again in Europe, 1991 through 1995, and as you see, this is what was Yugoslavia, it's in Southern Europe. Um, and, well, I guess I can point this out a little bit. Um, we had the first, first attacks happening in this region here. We had concentration camps throughout this region here. And then it exploded to about two thirds of Bosnia. And then a few years later, it started against Kosovo as well. All right. So um, some of these concentration camps were built before the attack, so in preparation for the attack. Um, and what survivors were reporting, who had survived concentration camps, were fleeing these Serbian-occupied areas, were a system of torture, mass killings, mutilations, but also rape and other sexualized torture, killings, forced impregnation. So all of these crimes above were something that we had heard of in relation to genocide in, in terms of how we understand genocide. But this other part, uh, we didn't know about. We didn't know how, how, do, you know, how do you talk about it? That part, that part was new. It's not that it didn't happen in previous genocides. I mean, the Nazis did sexual atrocities. There were sexual atrocities in other genocides. But it wasn't known about in the wider consciousness. It was a crime that remained hidden. And we needed to give it a name, just like we needed to give uh, the atrocity that we would come to call genocide a name. It didn't have a name before. So 1991, these are just some images. These are you know, mass graves throughout Croatia. There were mass graves throughout Bosnia. Um, here we have the first uncovering of concentration camps, a system of concentration camps. This is the Omaska concentration camp. It was a death camp. Many of our, the clients who were in our case were women survivors of this camp in um, northwestern Bosnia. Um, so these, when we see images like this, 
um, we can recognize them to some extent, given what we've learned about genocide in the intervening period after the Holocaust until now. Um, so the world responds. So as they see evidence of mass killings, concentration camps, and atrocities. They come, they, they have a name for what, you know, uh, to, to peg on these types of crimes. So for instance, starting in 1991, the French Jewish philosopher Ellen Finkelkraut called it ethnocide. Um, he's an expert on Holocaust denial and uh, Arendt's philosophy. So there was, a, there was a concept tied to this that fit the facts better than if it had been called war crimes, for instance. Um, Roy Gutman of Newsday from here, Long Island. Um, he just went off the beaten path as a journalist, went to these very dangerous parts of Bosnia. He broke the story about the Omarska concentration camp and you know, other horrific atrocities, as well as started one of the first people to start writing about the sexual atrocities um, in the media. So he knew what, he knew what to call it. Um, then three years later, even though it was named, we have atrocities happening again. It's just, it's just spreading to other parts of Bosnia. You may know of what happened in Srebrenica. Um, the UN at this point, um, it had initially been denying what was happening. Then um, as more and more you know, uh, evidence was coming up of these atrocities, it set up a series of safe havens in Bosnia. So a lot of the Bosnians were hiding from the Serbs who were, this is what they wanted to do to them. And so the UN said, well, we'll make some safe havens, come out of your hiding, go to the safe havens. So they went to the safe havens. And this is what happened. In three days, they massacred like over 8,000 Bosnian Muslim uh, men and boys. The Serbian forces there, they usually didn't allow relief supplies to come to the victims, but in this particular occasion, they allowed fuel to come in, and it was very peculiar. So they thought, wow, maybe they're kind of letting up that these people will be safe. They allowed the fuel to come in so that they could use the United Nations fuel to fuel the buses that they would put the victims on, and then they had the UN soldiers help them put the victims on the buses, then the buses took them to the mass graves where they executed them. So. The UN helped corral them into these safe havens, which they otherwise would not have trusted to go to. The UN supplied the fuel, and they supplied some of the soldiers who helped out to put them on the buses that took them here. So these, this is later a commemoration of bodies. They're still finding bodies. They're still excavating mass graves. It's an ongoing process. Um, so now we're back sort of at the, what I noted at the beginning of the lecture where genocide was a hidden crime. Now the sexual atrocity aspect of genocide is a hidden crime. It's still unknown. Um, so how do you make it known? Well, the key person in this is um, a person by the name of Asia Armanda. She's a Croatian Jewish feminist and philosopher. She's based in Zagreb. She grew up in Yugoslavia, which is a, which is a communist totalitarian state. But somehow, and she's this incredibly brilliant person, somehow she managed to maintain contact with the free world regarding knowledge about the Holocaust, about uh, feminist writings in the West, about issues of sexual violence. So she responded to the genocidal war in her midst, and she came to the aid of ref refugee survivors. This was while she was also under sniper fire. There were air raids going on in, in Croatia. There were attacks. But Croatia then became like the biggest uh, refugee center. There were over a million Bosnian refugees and displaced persons from eastern part of Croatia. So she went there working with survivors, and she started asking women questions, the right questions. And she uh, earned their trust and they began revealing traumatic experiences that they didn't even know how to articulate. They were, they were afraid to talk about. Um, they thought they wouldn't be believed. They just were trained, like women have been historically, that this is insignificant, that nobody, you know, that it's not gonna be taken seriously. But she took them seriously, and so that increased the trust. You know, then they would, you know, they heard, you know, in the refugee camps, there was word out that somebody really is interested in this, and word spread, and they kept, con they would contact her, and so then she found out that there was a pattern of mass rape and killing, rape and forcible impregnation, and sexual atrocities that make survivors wish they were dead. So she found wherever, whatever region 
across the occupied parts of Bosnia or Croatia, it didn't matter, there was, there was this pattern. And that suggested that that was a policy. It wasn't just you know, happening you know, in this one little isolated incident. incident. It, was, there, it, was a, it was a pattern. So she tries to let the world know. So what does she do? Well, the first place you go to that you think is gonna help you, you go to international human rights groups. You go to the international women's community. So Yugoslavia borders on Italy, Austria, Germany. Um, so she had contact with women's groups in these countries. Um, but the international human rights groups, they were functioning within their own inherited concepts. So they didn't have a history of dealing with mass crimes against women. So often the responses that she got were, you know, they didn't believe them. You know, some, some of them would say, well, you know, the Nazis didn't even do that, so probably it didn't happen. Or that they're war crimes, they happen on all sides. So even if it was, um, if, if it um, took place in the form of a war crime, like that it does happen on all sides in the same way, that would be all the more reason to investigate it rather than to dismiss it. And the European women's groups that she approached were not then very knowledgeable about sexual violence. I mean, she even went to their conferences. She brought them lists. These women are in concentration camps. These atrocities are happening to them. Help us do something. And it fell on deaf ears. So um, she gets me involved. This is August 1992. I was your age. i just gotten out of college. Um, I had the opportunity to study with Angela Davis, um, who, as you know, is a um, famous um, African-American philosopher or activist. Um, and I had just, I traveled to Europe before this, and I had the occasion to, to meet Asia, and that's how she knew me. I was sort of her contact. And um, studying with Angela Davis, you know, I studied in a more organized way these intersections between race and gender. You know, how women of certain racial or ethnic groups can be targeted in specific ways that are different from the ways other women are targeted. So that was an important theoretical clue to help us understand this. And then I was on my way to work with Catherine McKinnon at the University of Michigan Law School, who's um, a leading authority and theorist on sexual violence. I mean, literally, I was in my car from Los Angeles driving to Michigan, and then Asia gets in touch with me, and I was going to work with Catherine McKinnon on other topics that she works on, but instead, Asia pulled me into this issue, and then I pulled Catherine McKinnon into it. So I went to the war zone to help Armanda, and we named the crime genocidal sexual atrocities or genocidal rape. So we were familiar with Susan Brown Miller's notion of uh, war rape, rape as a weapon of war. It's the same on all sides. So we kind of, you know, we had that concept. We looked at the facts. The concept didn't fit the facts, so we had to think of another concept. Um, and then now the media starts to investigate. Asia is successful in, you know, we can't, we, the human rights groups aren't helping, the women's groups aren't helping, so we bypass them, we go to the media, people like Roy Gutman get the story out, um, and some European outlets get it out as well, and then we decide, um, you know, we, we're like going to all these places to beg them to help us, so how do we do something where we take action into our own hands, where we're at more active than passive, so we decide, well, we'll organize survivors for a lawsuit, and, you know, we don't know how or how this is going to happen, but, you know, maybe we can do something, make a case somewhere, and that could have the effect of, of stopping this, and as some of the survivors who were involved in our case said, we didn't want to leave the women behind, we wanted to do something for the women who were left in the camps. You know, those of us who survive, but, but there's women who are dying in the camps. We need to do something for them. Um, so the story breaks in the inter international media. Now the international women's movement and community gets involved. But, you know, by this time, there had been all this media attention to the genocide. It was recognized that it was a genocide, but the international women's community wasn't paying attention to it when it was a genocide. But now, when, um, or paying attention to it a lot less, but now that the issue of rape had uh, sort of broken the media, um, the way they tended to interpret this was through this Brown Miller idea that this is war rape. Oh, this is men raping women on all sides, it's the same. So this was not too helpful, which is not to say that, you know, men in every, that there aren't rapes in every group by men and, you know, cross ethnic lines, but this wasn't what was distinctive about these particular atrocities. Um, so there was the notion that, you know, the rapes were happening by rogue elements, by bad apples on all sides, that women on all sides were treated the same way. Um, so this ended up concealing or covering up the nature of these particular atrocities which were taking place in a particular way you know, by one group of men against women of other groups. 
So it was, it was part of a policy to destroy people on the basis of, eth of ethnicity and as women. Um, so we, the story broke in the international media, and then it became concealed again because people used that war rape concept, just like Nuremberg used the idea of war crimes to conceal um, the facts of genocide. So at this point, you know, I was in Croatia and Bosnia for like two months, and I went back to the University of Michigan Law School. So the idea was I would go and study what I initially studied, but then instead I asked Catherine McKinnon to help field the media questions that were um, being asked of me at this time, because the media started inquiring, and I, and I asked her to represent survivors. Can, we, you know, can you do something legally? What, what can we do? Um, and then um, she agreed to represent them, so then I returned to um, Croatia in 1993, it's a real typo there, to prepare legal action with survivors. So in early 1993, when Radovan Karadzic, head of the Bosnian Serbs, who's currently on trial at The Hague for the crime of genocide, he came to New York as a diplomat, as a, as a leader of the Bosnian Serb Republic, uh, to participate in UN peace talks. Um, we served him with legal papers um, in a civil action in New York charging him with genocide and sexual atrocities. So this is, um, you know, it, this also posed a major like legal challenge. There's no international venue to try this, this crime, so we had to create one. The way that the Israelis had to, when there was no legal forum to try Eichmann, what, you know, what do you do? Well, you, you try and you, the best way that you can to create a forum to get justice for this atrocity. Um, in 1995, the New York court recognized that sexual atrocities can be acts of genocide, and then Catherine McKinnon became a public voice um, that would hear what survivors were going through to break through that denial, um, you know, where rape as genocide was conflated with war rape. So this is Karadzic, the UN. But still, even three years later, he, he, he is one of the major architects of the Srebrenica genocide, the one that was assisted by the UN. So it didn't stop him, he kept going. Um, so some of the implications of this recognition of genocidal sexual atrocities. What we learned about genocide from the Holocaust made it possible to recognize it in places like Bosnia, Rwanda, Darfur, even though this crime was not recognized during the time of the Holocaust. Our work on genocidal sexual atrocities helped make it possible to investigate this crime right away when the Rwanda genocide happened. So we worked so hard, like lobbying, human rights groups, the media lawyers, anybody who would listen, just investigate this atrocity, go find out about it, uh, write about it. Um, but when the Rwandan genocide happened, um, it was covered right away. You know, so at that point, the issue had already broken in the international awareness, and so journalists had the green light that they could go investigate it here. And it also comes up in terms of investigations about what's happening in Darfur and more recently in the atrocities by Islamic State against Yazidi women in Iraq. Now, you know, people ask about this. They ask about the sexual atrocity dimension of destroying um, people as an ethnic group. Um, the United Nations finally, um, and so these crimes, there was some benefit in these other areas. Um, uh, because there was a concept that they could use to identify what was happening, something that was not immediately available in relation to atrocities and sexual atrocities in Bosnia. Then the United Nations finally formed the International Criminal Tribunals for Yugoslavia and for Rwanda, which then prosecuted perpetrators of genocide and sexual atrocities. I think I will end it there. So uh, directions for further inquiry, you know, now, like the next sort of philosophical task in relation to this issue of genocide is to discern dimensions of it that we still don't know about. And you do that by being grounded, you know, where it's happening, working with survivors, and eliciting, you know, what other dimensions of it do, do we still, do we still not uh, know about, uh, know about it. There's, there's a lot still to learn. Um, so that would be one way to continue this work. I think that's it, some acknowledgements there. All right, thank you. Good afternoon. Is this work? Is this working? No, okay. not close. It'd be kind of close. It's not close enough. Or? To you, yeah, to you. Okay. okay. Can you hear me now? Yes. I'm like that commercial. Can you that, what was it, that Verizon commercial? Um, 
Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Cindy Suhu. I teach at CUNY Law School, where I direct the International Women's Human Rights Clinic. I'm so pleased to be here today at the Kupfer, Kupferberg Center. Um, and it's just been great for me to actually get to meet uh, the faculty here, the faculty here, and um, to hear about the important work that you're doing. So I'm so pleased to be here and so pleased to be part of this important colloquia on uh, gender, mass violence, and genocide, and as well to be um, here with Natalie. Um, my talk today is going to be on the intersection of two movements where I think there have been incredible developments over the past 25 years. The first is the quest to hold individuals who commit egregious human rights abuses responsible for their crimes. And the second is the movement to integrate a gender perspective into international human rights and humanitarian law. And here, I think I'll, I, I'm going to try a little bit to, I, I hear, Natalie, I know, sort of experienced the, uh, the Bosnia conflict firsthand and worked so closely with, survi with survivors um, working to document what happened. I'm going to try a little bit to defend uh, the women's human, international women's human rights movement, but recognizing, I'm sure, that there are areas where they, uh, and places where they came, uh, came to the game late or maybe failed to, to recognize the full uh, impact of what was going on in Bosnia um, soon enough. Okay. So um, after the horrors of World War II, the international co community recognized that the protection of human rights is a subject of global concern, um, uh, uh, and that it requires inter an international commitment to uphold human rights and to hold those who commit mass atrocities responsible for their actions. Since wo World War II, the international community has made significant progress on human rights, including recognizing human rights and uh, human rights and humanitarian law protections in international treaties, and de developing and strengthening UN protections and enforcement mechanisms. Efforts to impose international criminal responsibility for mass atrocities led to the creation of ad hoc criminal tribunals in the 1990s and the establishment of the per Permanent International Criminal Court in 2002. These have been substantial milestones which I think should be celebrated. Yet, as the legal architecture was developing to hold individuals accountable for egregious human rights abuses, there was a concern that women would be left behind. Throughout, throughout history, women have suffered unique violations and rights abuses because of their gender, including domestic violence, rape, and sexual abuse. The everyday violence that women suffer is repeated and, and exacerbated in times of war and conflict. Yet throughout our history, the rights violations suffered by women were, for the most part, largely invisible. The International Women's Human Rights Clinic was founded by Professor Rhonda Copeland in 1992 to address this issue. CUNY Law School's International Women's Human Rights Clinic was one of the first law school human rights clinics in the country, and at that time it was the only one to focus on women's issues. Professor Copeland came to CUNY after a career with the Center for Constitutional Rights. At CCR, she brought the groundbreaking Philartica case that used the Alien Tort, St tort Statute to open up U.S. courts to victims of human rights abuses. In creating the clinic, she sought to focus on creating accountability for human rights violations and ensuring that gender-based viola violations, harms predominantly suffered by women, were part of the human rights conversation. I want to emphasize that Professor Copeland was not alone in this goal. She worked side by side with dedicated women's rights activists who created a movement that took the issue of gender-based violence, invisible to, for most of human history, and brought it to the mainstream of the global human rights discourse. In my talk today, I'm going to first summarize the global gains in creating accountability for human rights violations, and then devote the majority of my time to discussing the tremendous progress that has been made on gender-based violence in the 1990s. Um, in my human rights class, we discuss that the modern human rights movement really began after World War II. Prior to World War II, um, under international law, the prevailing wisdom was that what countries did within their own boundaries was not, the ma was not a matter for, of international concerns. The horrors of World War II shocked the world's conscience, and the international community recognized a collective responsibility to prevent human rights abuses. In addition to creating the UN in 1945, there was a recognition that individual, individuals should be held responsible for serious human rights violations. Um, uh, so uh, the international military tribunals were created in Nuremberg in Tokyo. And the purpose of these tribunals was to try Axis powers responsible for atrocities committed during World War II. But as Natalie said, at the tribunals, individuals who committed acts of genocide were convicted of war crimes and crimes against, against humani humanity, but not genocide, because prior to World War II, there was no international legal definition of genocide. Recognizing the need to name what had happened and to create an international legal response, the Genocide Convention was one of the first treaties adopted by the UN in 1948. 
It defines genocide as the commission of certain acts with intent to destroy, in whole or in part, a national, ethnic, racial, or religious group. But once genocide was recognized as an international crime, there needed to be courts that would be willing to try the perpetrators. After the convention, uh, sorry, under the convention, all nations have an obligation to prevent and punish genocide, and individuals accused of genocide can be tried in national courts or in an international court. However, the, the um, creation of a permanent international criminal court would prove to be elusive. Although a commission was charged with developing recommendations for a court in 1947, the Cold War set in in the 1950s and the work on the court stalled. After the, in the 1990s, after the fall of the Berlin Wall, worldwide attention was captured by the genocide that occurring in Bosnia and later R Rwanda. This led to a new interest in international responses to mass atrocities. In 1993, the UN Security Council creates the International Criminal Tribunal for the former, Yuslo former Yugoslavia, or ICTY. And in 1995, it creates the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda, or the ICTR. In 2002, building on the law and procedures developed in the ad hoc criminal tribunals, the International uh, Criminal Court, or ICC, was created. The ICC has jurisdiction over the most serious international crimes what I like to think of as the big three. War crimes, crimes against humanity, and genocide. Um, I'll note that in addition to the creation of international criminal courts and tribunals, there has been substantial progress in opening up national courts as forums to try international crimes and human rights abuses. In addition to the alien tort, stat in addition to the alien tort statute litigation, which I discussed earlier, um, starting in the 1990s, prosecutors in Europe have brought criminal proceedings against former dictators accused of genocide and crimes against humanity based on the doctrine of universal jurisdiction. Indeed, the ICC statute is built on the principle that nations have the responsibility to investigate and prosecute international crimes, and its jurisdiction is limited to instances where national courts are unable or unwilling to prosecute. Now, I want to shift my remarks to discuss the struggle to recognize gender-based crimes under international law. International media coverage of the, the use of rape as a weapon of war in Bosnia was a big part of the pressure to, to create the Yugoslavia Tribunal. But despite this, it was in no way certain that the ICTY or ICTR would prosecute gender-based crimes as serious violations of international law. Why do I say this? Because until the 1990s, gender-based crimes were consistently minimized or ignored during conflict. Um, walking around the center earlier today, I was pleased to see the, um, the events and the work and the memorials that the center has to ensure that the experience of the comfort women um, in World War II uh, is not forgotten. Um, but at, the fact is that after World War II, prosecutors in the Tokyo Tribunal failed to indict Japanese officials for the sexual enslavement of an estimated 200,000 young women during World War II. Euphemistically referred to as comfort women, these women were abducted from Japanese-controlled territories and forced to travel with the troops to serve as sexual slaves. This system was authorized at the highest levels of the Japanese military, yet no one was charged. Despite this consistent pattern, in the, um, in the 1990s, historical gains were made in surfacing gender rights gendered rights violations and making them part of the mainstream of international criminal law. These legal uh, gains include groundbreaking decisions from the ICTY and ICTR tribunals, recognizing rape and sexual violence as a form of genocide, and rape as a form of torture, um, as well as the explicit inclusion of crimes of sexual violence in the ICC statute um, as crimes that, be, that can be prosecuted as war crimes and crimes against humanity. So what made these changes possible? Uh, first and foremost, I think the, the work of um, the, uh, the, the, the women and men, I, 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 maybe they were men, but the people who, um, the, yeah, they were men, the, who came forward, the victims who were w willing to share their stories and the, the people who worked closely with them to document what had happened. Because I think one uh, recurring issue um, with sexual violence is making it visible. And it's so difficult, I think, for survivors to come forward and to share their stories. And often when they do that, do it, they don't have the support that they need. So I think that that work was crucial. Um, I think the work of, of feminist scholars and theorists also made visible the gender bias in the law. Um, and they helped, they developed legal theories and strategies to change it. Um, and um, I'm pleased to be here with Natalie, who was a, 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 a initial, um, uh, theorist on this issue, but I also want to recognize the work of Catherine McKinnon and Professor Copeland and Charlotte Bunch and many others. Um, but I think uh, um, that another big factor in the change that we've seen in international law 
was the active, active global uh, women's movement that consistently and effectively and stubbornly demanded change. After the adoption of the ICC statute, Professor Copeland was asked to reflect on the progress made in the 1990s. And she said, the gains of which I will speak were successful because they animated from a global mobilization of women, asserting that women's rights are human rights, um, that human rights are indivisible, and that impunity for gender crimes and acceptance of discrimination must end. Through mobilization, women's movements have become a force to be reckoned with internationally, despite the desperate and concerted efforts of right-wing religious forces to block our progress and reluctance of others to accept or recognize the need to make gender inclusiveness a priority. The interrelationship between mobilization at every level and international legal change exemplifies the basic principle that human rights, like law itself, are not autonomous, but rise and fall on the course and strength of people's movements and the popular and political pressure and cultural change they generate. In particular, Professor Copeland, as well as political scientists like Catherine McKinnon, have connected global gains in addressing gender-based violence to effective women's organizing and mobilization around a series of international conferences on human rights and development in the 1980s and 90s. Organizations around these conferences brought together women's rights activists from around the world. These activists worked uh, to mainstream women's rights in all aspects of human rights, but a clear priority that emerged was the need to address gender-based violence as a human rights violation. At the World Conferences, the women's rights movement hijacked the global human rights agenda. For instance, women's rights were not even in the preparatory documents for the 1993 Vienna, Convention on, uh, on, uh, Vienna Conference on Human Rights. But through the work of human rights activists, the consensus documents adopted by 171 countries after the conference made women's rights and gender-based violence a focus. The Vienna Declaration specifically recognized that system, systemic rape, sexual slavery, and forced pregnancy violate fundamental, principle, fundamental principles of international law and that perpetrators must be persecuted and punished. The women's movement created visibility for gender-based violence and political pressure on the international community to address it. The organization and sustained pressure from the movement would prove important during the ad hoc tribunals and the creation of the ICC. As I mentioned earlier, historic cases came out of the ICTY and the ICTR. Yet despite the international attention to the use of rape in Bosnia and the evidence that 250 to 500,000 women were raped as part of the genocide in R Rwanda, the prosecutors in the ad hoc tribunal were initially slow to charge defendants with gender-based crimes. Um, because of this, monitoring groups sent multiple letters to the prosecutor's office calling for institutional changes and more effective investigation and prosecution of gender crimes. The ICTR case against Jean-Paul Akiesu is famous for being the first case to recognize that rape and sexual violence can be instruments of genocide. But rape and sexual violence crimes were not included in his, in his addition, uh, initial indictment. Even though the rape was not included in the charging documents in the Akiesu case, during the trial, information about rape started to come out when a woman testified that her six-year-old daughter was raped by three men who murdered her husband. Navi, Navi Pile, a, a female judge from South Africa, pursued the line of questioning, asking two other witnesses um, about uh, whether rape occurred in the district. Based on the testimony, IWHR and a coalition of groups filed an amicus brief urging a continuance to allow the pros prosecutor to investigate the rapes and amend the indictment. The indictment was amend amended and the rest is history. But the landmark Akiesu case may not have happened but for the interve intervention of Judge Pile and the consistent monitoring and pressure placed on the prosecutor's office. When it came time to draft the ICC statute, the Women's Caucus for Gender Justice formed to monitor and influence the negotiations. The statute that emerged reflected most of the caucus's demands. The ICC statute leaves no doubt that gender-based crimes can form the basis of conviction for the big three international crimes, genocide, crimes against humanity, and war crimes. Um, the ICC statute also ensures the, um, the integration of a gender perspective on the court by recognizing the need for fair representation of female judges and uh, judges with expertise on violence against women and children. Finally, the statute pro provides important protections for witnesses and victims and creates a victims unit with experts in, on trauma and sexual violence. Through the work of a generation of women's rights activists, we have seen tremendous changes in the recognition of gender crimes under international law and the creation of institutions to address them. But more work remains to be done. The history of the ad hoc tribunals teaches us that we must continue to be vigilant to make sure that gender-based crimes are investigated and documented and prosecuted at the ICC as well in, as in national courts. 
And in, and, and in addition to making sure that crimes against women are recognized, prosecuted, and, prosecuted and punished, we, also, we must also do more to prevent armed conflicts and violent extremism. In 2000, the UN Security Council issued Resolution 1325 on Women, Peace, and Security. The resolution emphasized the need to take a gender perspective in conflict and protect women and girls from sexual violence. But it goes further and stresses the importance of women's equal participation and full involvement in efforts to maintain and promote peace and security. In particular, it emphasizes the need for women to participate in preventing and resolving conflicts, peace negotiation, peace building, humanitarian responses, and post-conflict reconstruction. This year is the 15th anniversary of, of Resolution 1325. To mark the anniversary, the Security Council commissioned a global study and review that was released earlier this month. The reports forward, in the reports forward, Fimzile Malambu Nuka, Executive Director of UN Women, writes, Resolution 1325 was one of the crowning achievements of the global women's movement and one of the most inspired decisions of the UN Security Council. The recognition that peace is inextricably linked with gender equality and women's leadership was a radical step for the highest body tasked with maintenance of international peace and security. But like Professor Copeland, she warns us, warns us that the creation of legal recognition is an important first step, but not enough. She goes on to say, we have an enormous responsibility to ensure that the normative framework spurred by Resolution 1325 is not just given periodic visibility and attention, but that it lies at the heart of the UN's work on peace and security. My colleague Kathleen, uh, Catherine Powell at the Center for Foreign Relations has written that in the last 15 years, we've seen tremendous progress in addressing the issues women face as victims of sexual abuse and other violations uh, during wartime, but less progress on increasing the role of women as agents of change. This, I think, is the next challenge for the women's rights movement to build on the gains that we have made to ensure not only that women's rights violations are recognized in times of conflict and mass violence, but that women have an active role in preventing such violence. Thank you. So it certainly seems like your comments. Sorry. Mm -hmm. I guess not. I just learned that. Do they need to be off? Um, so I'll speak loud. Um, it certainly seems like your comments build on each other's, and there are, at some points are some um, uh, contrasts, tensions between your comments, which I think probably illustrate the reality of this kind of action on the ground. Right? Sometimes the legal response is not quick enough for the people, and sometimes a legal response has to take its time for it to be the structure that we need it to be. So I wondered if, uh, before we invite questions from students, if you would like to speak to each other about uh, those opportunities and those tensions that exist in your comments. Um, yeah, you know, when, when I was putting these remarks together, it's interesting because I um, teach international women's human rights law and really my focus has been trying to think about addressing um, gender bias in trying to mainstream um, the experience of women in, in human rights law and international law. Um, and, uh, you know, I, and I think we, we agree um, that there has been a long history of violence against women in times of conflict. Um, and that that has really, you know, been failed to be addressed by international law um, or the international community for many years. I think the, the um, and I think an overall goal of the women's movement in the 1980s and 1990s was really um, surfacing gender-based violence and making the, the law and the public aware of it and to take it seriously. Um, I think, uh, and I think what, you know, but when we're talking about genocide, I think there's also an issue in terms of, is this a different kind of violence against women and should it be looked at as in a different way rather than through sort of the lens um, that uh, we look at other kinds of uh, sexual abuse of, of women in conflict, right? I mean, I think uh, maybe that's sort of the nugget of, of the, the tension, is that? Yeah, just to, to recognize that it's distinct. So yeah. it's, yeah. you know, that these facts need to be conceptualized in this way. These yeah. set of facts where it does happen on all sides have to be conceptualized yeah. that way. And then these facts of sexual atrocities in peacetime 
you know, have their own kind of concept. So <laughs> the tension was to, to rest out from under the, the distinct kind of ways that women who were targeted for genocide were sexually targeted so that war rape doesn't conceal it. it. It can stay as its own category, but it lets this one be. And so this is the nugget of the tension because it would assert a sameness mm -hmm. that wasn't experienced by survivors. Yeah. Um, so we saw that tension like throughout mm -hmm. the, the work of, of you know, getting this issue out. And I mean, you had mentioned, you know, there's, there's a few things that, that you had mentioned that I, I was kind of, I was privy to actually on the ground yeah. when some of these things were happening. So, um, you know, when we had our case, um, when Rhonda Copeland had written about it initially, it was, mm -hmm. it was war rape. And so we were in very much tension with that mm -hmm. approach. And then the Vienna Conference on Women's Rights, I, I was at the Vienna Conference on Women's Rights. Mm -hmm. And it was, it's 1993, it's happening down the road from the you know, biggest you know, yeah. example of genocide concentration camps in Europe since the Holocaust, down the road. And you have women's organizations there who are utterly oblivious to this and not providing a place, a space for survivors. And so the, the, the concentration camp survivors, women who had sur survived this, were trying to find a way to be present because the people who were actually taking a lot of the space were not only women who weren't understanding this as rape as genocide, but e women who actually were echoing Serbian propaganda, who mm -hmm. were from Serbia, who uh, were minimizing for whatever reasons um, mm -hmm. that, you know, that this was happening. And so um, they asked Catherine McKinnon if she could try to create a space there. And somehow, through survivor groups, we were able to have like one little tiny forum where they could speak and have mm -hmm. a space in this conference about you know, atrocities happening to women all over the world. Down the road, there are death camps operating where they have no representation in, in this forum. So that, mm -hmm. you know, that was, a, that was a, a, a point of tension. And um, you, know, you also mentioned, you know, of course, it's very difficult to have, you know, to create circumstances so survivors can feel safe to, you know, to speak. And so when we tried to get the representatives from the, you know, um, the UN to come, um, you know, many of them had no experience working with sexual violence right. uh, survivors. Um, they, I remember being in this, um, you know, they'd come to this grand hotel in Zagreb in Croatia. They were having parties and there were survivors who just come out of the most horrific situation. They're out there waiting for them to talk to them and they don't have time for them because they're having festivities. And so these you know, women, young girls, they, they, they leave. They, they, don't, you know, they don't have a place to live. They don't have food. They barely have clothes. And so they're not you know, being, you know, there was just a great disconnect with this UN you know, yeah. um, bureaucracy and, and the women there. And then, um, um, yeah. And then you know, they had some of the translators, for instance. Um, I, I had witnessed this myself. I was, they're listening to this. They, they had Serbian translators who were translating in the language of the perpetrators and also mistranslating what was happening so that it you know, minimized what actually had happened. So there are all these things that we would never have you know, expected. And you know, another point, too, um, was when, you know, when they declared, OK, there's going to be this criminal tribunal, that there'll be jurisdiction over war crimes, crimes against humanity, and genocide, um, Professor Copeland actually she wrote a, a letter Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, to the court there re um, requesting a policy change so that there could be an exception such that there could be a space for the possibility of consent, re mm -hmm. consensual relationships under this rubric. And survivors were horrified because, you know, they, they couldn't believe that, in, you know, that, that somebody would push that kind of a, a initiative and it scared them away from the tribunal because they felt that they you know, it could be said that they wanted it, that they, you know, that they had consensual relationships. So I, I would say that, like, the main source of that disconnect is, like, working from afar rather than, like, mm. constantly, like, running your decisions by survival, like, vetting it out mm. with people on the ground so that that is part of the conversation as well. I mean, we've always, we've often criticized, you know, the traditional way of looking at human rights in ways that are disconnected from women's experiences having to be regrounded, but that could also happen 
when, you know, women who are seeking to expand women's human rights, but in a way that is disconnected from, you know, those who are, are experiencing um, those horrific violations. Um, I, well, let me maybe, well, that's a lot, you said, you said, had a lot of comments, and I, yeah, appreciate your, um, your comments, especially as someone who was directly involved in this, this specific conflict, which I, I was not. I, I mean, I'll say that um, I think a lot of work of the international w women's movement and women's activists has actually been to mainstream a gender perspective in the UN. And, and I think that we all are appalled and, and we all recognize. And, and when I talked earlier about the need to have women judges on international criminal tribunals and at the ICC, having a, a victims protection unit um, uh, w with services for f survivors, including uh, criminal p uh, protections in terms of uh, the use of, of, of uh, former uh, sexual experience, you know, uh, having sh uh, mm -hmm. shield rules. I mean, that was all, I think, on the agenda um, and, and something that the women's movement worked for. I mean, and I, I think that it, um, I think there is, I mean, as I said in the beginning, I think that there is a tension in terms of, um, Thinking about whether uh, rape in, in rape and genocide, or, or recognizing the difference between of uh, rape and genocide and rape rape and other con as a form of genocide and rape in other contexts. I think you know the reason why uh, the in international the ICC um, uh, had jurisdiction over. Um, genocide, crimes against humanity, and war crimes is sort of this recognition that this, you know, these are certain crimes where the international community actually has the right um, and the interest in prosecuting because, you know, they're sort of a larger harm. I think, you know, some of the concern of the women's movement, though, was that even as we're recognizing uh, that rape can be a, a form of genocide and that it is one of the most serious uh, genocide is one of the most serious international crimes. The concern that rape that happened every day as a part of, war, you know, every day in women's lives and rape that occurred uh, as, par as part of wartime in terms of, you know, the rapes that were su suffered from women who were view viewed as booty or the comfort, wo uh, the comfort women would not be um, eclipsed as we're sort of focusing on uh, the harm to women as part of a community. You know, and I think that that was, that was part of the tension in terms of thinking about, yes, we want, we want to recognize the unique harm when rape is used as a form of, of genocide, but we also want to make sure that we don't forget that women um, are, have been victims of sexual violence in times of conflict uh, and not eclipsing that. Mm -hmm. So I think that was part of the, the tension. Um, I actually, oh, I actually had a number of things that I would, would have loved to ask, but just following up on the last thing, um, it seems to me that what's missing just, and maybe you can clarify a little more, is just why it is important to include it within genocide and not just, it's, it's like why we have the term genocide to begin with. There's always mass violence, there's always individual violence, but the same kind of comparison between a, a, a rape by a husband or a rape by a relative it, although, of course it is terrible. This is why I don't let my students use the word terrible or horrible, because th of course it is. But that we are talking about something um, qualitatively different and something that has a broader impact. And so maybe you can address that. I think that kind of answers as to why this is important. Um, and it also explains, I think, to the students why it matters and why the genocide term matters. I actually also wanted to ask you if you think perhaps the genocide concept itself is the problem here. That we know from Lemkin's footnotes that he grapples with the term ethnocide, that maybe that is the more appropriate word. And one of the things that, even though the Genocide Convention doesn't do this, there is this connection between, um, the, it, it develops this connection between genocide as if it is only involved in death and mass annihilation. Lemkin himself, of course, didn't do that, but that becomes sort of the development. I'm critical of Lemkin generally, but one of the things that it seems to me that maybe it is a more appropriate word, and maybe the genocide word needs to be rejected, that perhaps ethnocide perhaps better includes this range of acts that in fact Lemkin himself was involved in. So those are the two things. Oh, um, it, perhaps, I mean, 
Oh, I, I, perhaps um, it, it, it could be expanded. I, I mean, I'd have to think about that more carefully, but um, you know, sort of what does come to mind in terms of like ethnocide would perhaps recognize a crime that took place where there wasn't an explicit racial policy as took place against the Jews. Um, so it may be a, a, a difference of like precision, um, but in terms of like modifying it that way, I, I, I'm, I'm not sure. But um, I think that because women experience it in a distinct way, in, an, in, a, in a context where they're targeted for destruction as part of their ethnic or racial group, it's a different set of experiences. And the, and the issue merely was to give it its proper name because it didn't happen as this, you know, getting back at one group or another. It's, you're, you know, you're a target for destruction and women of that group are gonna be targeted in a particular way or there's a sexualized way of killing somebody that takes place mainly against women, though not all the time women. I mean, we, you know, while the, you know, the Vienna Conference was happening, we would just, we were talk, we went to a refugee center where all the people were fleeing out of Bosnia in this part of Croatia that was under sniper attack. And there were Bosnian men who heard us talking about women and then they came up to us and they said, well, you know, you know, it didn't just happen to women. And they, were, they kept lingering around and we're like, what, you know, what, why are these guys around? What are they doing? And then they came to us and they said that, you know, these atrocities have happened to men as, as, as part of genocide. So it's just merely to respect that it's a different set of experiences um, that was not visible, whereas war rape had some visibility, not enough visibility. It should have more visibility. And it's just respecting the distinctions so that one doesn't eclipse the other and so that you have... Oh, a way of understanding a set of, you have the proper concept for the different contexts and you can navigate them properly so that survivors don't feel re-violated right. in the way that you're naming it. Yeah, and I, I mean, I think, and the most important thing is also to recognize how survivors experience the violence. And, and I think that, you know, there is a history of, of, um, of looking at people sort of based on, on one identity. And I think that we have to recognize that women, that everyone has intersectional identities, mm -hmm. right? And so, you know, when we're talking about rape as genocide, we're talking about uh, women being targeted because of uh, a, a, an intersection of two identities. Um, and, and I think that that's an important distinction. You know, I mean, I think another concern, and, and I've actually worked less in this area than, than you have, but I mean, I think another concern when the, we're thinking about the concept of, of uh, rape uh, as genocide is that there's a danger that it be only, only understood mm -hmm. as, um, a, as uh, harming a group rather than harming women as individuals or, or women as women. Um, because I think you know, there has been a history uh, in terms of uh, thinking about rape as not a, a violent crime and, and uh, violation of a woman, but rather a violation of, uh, you know, thinking of, of women as property, right? So like in some, in some countries or, you know, there have been, have been historically, uh, if a woman w was raped, it was viewed as an honor crime against her family. Or if a woman was raped, um, you know, if the person who raped her married her, uh, it would be okay. Right, so I think that we have to also recognize that it's an individual harm against a woman and not just a harm against a people. Yeah, I, I think that's a really important point, and um, I, I just uh, I do want to emphasize that the recognition came just, I mean, I think that, that lets me enter with another interesting point, which is that the people who were most animated to get this recognized came from that very perspective that you're talking mm -hmm. about that recognizes it first and foremost as a violation of her as an individual, as a woman then, and then that was the foundation for how then do we fit this with the, with the um, ethnic component. It's not that the people who understood genocide were now investigating how do we talk about women that got it recognized like this. This was, this, this came, mm -hmm. this was a feminist movement. Mm -hmm. This came from people who were coming from that perspective that you're saying, mm -hmm. but then really worked, like you said, on their experiences, how they experienced it. And then okay. from that, they elicited the, um, the ethnic 
component. So it didn't go that, the other way. There were attempts to go the other way. So mm -hmm. for instance, um, just individual Bosnians on the ground who were reporting what was happening, they had you know, just you know, people from a village. You know, they didn't have a sophisticated apparatus for how to call this, not even how to call a genocide, but trying to be responsible to what was happening there, to their community, they would say, well, then the young women were taken away to this place, and, and you know, then they use euphemism, all these horrible things happened to them. And so they were trying, they're groping for a language for how to call this. So they were trying from their way, and it, you know, it kind of didn't fit. Roy Gutman, who broke the story of the death camps and had a way to talk about genocide, was trying with you know, his language. And you know, first they were talked about as bordellos and brothels, which is the peacetime way that sexual violence is denied, mm -hmm. transposed into a genocide context. So that's what happens when you go from, OK, you understand genocide and how do we fit women in. But if you go from this way, from a feminist way that starts first as women, uh, first as an individual, then as women, and then, then you negotiate the, gen the, the uh, uh, race and ethnicity side, then you can arrive at the, the balance um, that you were, you know, I think so rightly saying is the, mm -hmm. you know, the more responsible way to talk about this. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Um, okay. Uh, well, there's a few, well. In terms of punishment, I think you know this issue in terms of how do we hold people accountable is difficult. I mean, first of all, anytime you know, in in a normal everyday context, right? Rape is illegal. Murder is illegal. Sexual violence is illegal. Um, what we're talking, you know, what we've mostly been talking about here is mass mass violence, mass rape. Uh, in the context of conflict or, 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 or war, um, which is really recognized um, as an international crime, right? And usually what happens though with, with when these levels of atrocities occur, it's often difficult for societies to try people for these crimes, you know, often because they were leaders in their community or the political up, uh, upheaval. Um, and the reason why the ICTY and the ICTR were created was to try to create a forum to, to hold these people accountable outside of their everyday criminal justice system. Um, you know, the, IC, the idea of the ICC is it's also supposed to be a place where you can bring uh, people who've been uh, accused of these most um, serious international uh, crimes, but the problem is um, not all, all countries have ratified uh, the ICC, including the United States, and uh, the, the ICC is incredibly limited in terms of uh, its, its staff um, and, 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 frankly, political will because a lot of, you know, the, the ICT, IC, ICC has issued a lot of um, indictments, but it doesn't have a police force, right? So it can indict people, but unless countries around the world actually take steps to, to arrest these people and bring them to The Hague, they're not going to be um, uh, held accountable. So I think we're, we still have, I mean, I sort of talked about that there have been advances, but we still have an incredible gap in terms of actually enforcing and holding people accountable. I mean, I would just add that I, that I agree that there, there's this major gap in terms of inter, international enforcement and, you know, the f few people that have been prosecuted, I mean, they, they serve sentences in different parts of Europe. They get off on good behavior. One of the major architects of the genocide a woman who was with Karadzic was, I think she, her term was only five years and she got off for good behavior. Um, so it's just, there's a real gap in terms of um, enforcement and perhaps, I mean, maybe you could speak better to this than I can, but 
perhaps that opens the door for pursuing uh, courts in national venues because it's within a jurisdiction, you have a police force, you have the mechanisms that are needed to, to take care of justice better than is in place in an international venue. So that may be something to do in the alternative till the international system gets better on these things? Hmm? Yeah, yeah. Thank you for mentioning that point. It's a really, it's a, it's a, it's a really good point that we had to think a lot about when we were working to get make this crime visible. I mean, you mentioned the Armenian genocide. I've gone to some events on the Armenian genocide. There's people who've written like poetry and other kind of literary responses, survivors. There's like it's woven in there, and you'd have to go, you know, kind of unstitch it and see it as its discrete, you know, kind of crime. And of course, in the Holocaust, there's more, a lot more evidence uh, of that having taken place. But I would also add that it's important also to, to have an environment that can hear it. Because, and this is what I, this is what I, when I began working on this, um, I had heard that this had empowered some women who survived the Holocaust to talk about what had happened and that before they couldn't talk about. Um, but survivors of this genocide, initially, it, 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 was, it, it was a very difficult choice to decide to speak, um, not only because it wouldn't be heard, but it would be turned around in a way that blamed them or that called it war rape or that, you know, all these ways of denial that, that is, as we know from Holocaust literature, denial is like the second death. So I, I don't know if I, you know, I would, I would feel like I would have to tell these survivors, these are the possibilities of what's going to happen to you if you say this. So you create a space for it to be heard, but you also know that It'll be, you know, it might be minimized. I think there was, this is what I heard, I, I, you know, I don't know this in, in, a, in a studied way, but that there was fear that if we talked about sexual atrocities during the Holocaust, because women's experiences are so minimized, then the Holocaust itself, it would like rub off on that. There, like there wasn't an audience, like a, there wasn't an intersection of a feminist movement to be able to hear that. So what, what is worse? Not, not you know, being silent, or saying something in a way that then is torturing you in another way. I, mm -hmm. I, you know, I would have to leave that up to the survivor to to make their decision, knowing, you know, as much as they can about the context of receptivity. I mean, there were times when I was even wondering. I mean, that I, I it's I have to do my diligence in relation to these survivors to, to tell them how this is going to be perceived. And there, in, in the, the darkest days of trying to get this issue out, when, you know, I mean, it was, it was a nightmare when, you know, the international women's community finally, like, recognized it, but then kept calling it like it's the same on all sides. It makes you wonder, you know, perhaps it's not good to talk, you know, if, it, if you're going to be re-violated in this way, do you have the wherewithal to keep doing this? I mean, it's a very hard, difficult, complex decision to make, and I just want to emphasize that it's important also 
that there's someone to, you know, to, to hear it, to recognize it, and not then reviolate you in the way that they are, they're framing it, whether blaming you or, you know, like, like they do in peacetime or calling it what it isn't or whatever. Mm -hmm. Uh -huh. and, and she's referring to all these atrocities that occurred to her and her family ever since she saw. She never used the word rape. It was always outrage. And then as I finished reading that, yeah. I wondered if you know when that word rape was first was uh, recognized as a term. Huh. Is it a very new thing or is it something that has been a part of our culture for a long time? Well, it, but is there euphemism? I mean, is there, are there things there that you're suspecting are possibly sexual atrocities, but they don't give it a language, or you don't know? Outrageous. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that goes to the... the, the yeah, I, I suspect that that was like a, maybe a political choice that the writer made. I mean... Herself, yeah. yeah. Oh. Right, right, right. Well, th yeah, this yeah. is what Asya encountered, and that's why it's it was so key that she knew how to ask the right question because they that's they were bungling around like trying yeah. to figure out a language. They were speaking that language, and you know when you know the the Bosnians in the, in the in the villages of Bosnia who were recording what was they would say, and outrages were done against women, or you know there's these euphemisms because. They don't have a, a, a language that recognizes it. So th that was the challenge here for her to elicit from them, like to be able to ask them questions so that they can come to call it that yeah. and feel safe to call it that and not be afraid, well, then they're going to be called a prostitute or that it's going to be, you know, or they're going to be, or they ask for it. You know, all the kind of denial that comes with explicitly naming something as a sexual um, violation. Yeah. And, and I'll, I'll just add, I mean, I think, you know, when part of the difficulty or, or, or one of the suggested reasons for the failure to charge um, gendered crimes in the, initially in the ICTR and the ICTY was because the investigators really weren't trained, right? They didn't really actually know how to, yeah. to ask questions in a sensitive way in order to get the information. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, it's funny when you say rape culture, I mean, I also just think about, the, you know, we're having that conversation in the United States as well, right? And, and just this idea, you know, I think I talked about it a little bit uh, in the context of war, right? That, um, you know, initially, I, I mean, I many people have, have probably watched Game of Thrones, right? Like, you know, just this idea that, you know, w rape was part of, 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 of war, and it, for a period of time, it was accepted. And then I think, you know, there were the laws that developed that sort of recognized it wasn't proper, but just this view that this is what happens, right? This is what happens. And it's sim I think it's similar to the rape cu culture we have today in terms of boys will be boys, right? Um, and so that even, even though there was sort of uh, some recognition that was improper, it was just not taken seriously. It wasn't punished, as we saw in the case of the, the comfort women, right? You, you had this whole tribunal that was put together to deal with war time atrocities, and you had the systematic system, uh, you know, sexual enslavement of women, and, you know, there, there's nothing in the, in the tribunal. Yeah, I, I think it was, a, it was a significant issue in bringing it up in, in relation to the Bosnian genocide. I mean, you had in that culture, um, like, pornography was rampant, so it, it, ha it normalized, it, it was, in the culture, it became normal 
that you know women enjoy these kinds of things. They enjoy you know they enjoy sexual violations. So that's all the more reason not to say what happened to you because it's going to be you know pulled into that and reinterpreted into that. So that functions as a you know a silencing mechanism. And um, so I mean I think that functioned on the individual level that you're afraid to call it what it is because there's already a language of denial from peacetime. Yeah, it's going yeah. to, you know, make it into blame the victim. So there's all that. So that just highlights one level of the various denials. You know, the peacetime denial. You know, the war. You know, all the levels. Um, and I mean, I think that poses a very interesting question in terms of um, being able to talk about it now in Western societies where the rape culture is getting worse. Um, and then, you know, is that making, is that having more of a silencing effect? Is you know the recognition that you know you're working so hard to to um, um, come into effect, is, is that strong enough to overcome the rape culture? I don't know, that would be an interesting dissertation for somebody to do. Yeah, but it's a very good question, thank you. Are we, uh Yeah, well, you made many, many uh, comments, and I, I mean, I, I think you're right in terms of, you know, just this lack of, of attention and believing people is is a, a problem that we continually have. And I also do agree with you that we that that w women's movements need to work together. I feel like you know another co a common critique of the international uh, human rights movements, right, is that they're sort of like a top-down thing, right, in terms of it's you sort of Western groups defining priorities and 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 sort of. Uh, saying this is what the human rights is about rather than being a bottom-up process where we're actively engaging with people and recognizing their um, intersectional identities, their, their nationality, their experiences, and bringing that up in terms of making it, you know, the human rights response. And, and, I, and I do think also that, um, well, there's this need, of course, to work together, and as you mentioned, you know, this need also to recognize the, you know, intersecting forms of oppression. And, Part of what was very, you know, interesting about the African American women's movement is, you know, some of the early writings in the 80s was this recognition that, you know, sometimes, you know, you, you have a commonality with women, but sometimes you have more of the same commonality with your, with your ethnic group, especially if the women that you're working with don't recognize what's happening to you in terms of your ethnicity. And so this is something I really understood you know, in working in the Bosnian genocide. So I understood less as an American white woman, but going there, it really, it really came to life. And so um, I think that, you know, it's important to do working together, but also, you know, you recognize in some, on some issues of your gender oppression, you feel safer with women. On some issues, you feel safer in a center that is addressing the Holocaust. So, you know, your ethnic group. 
Sorry. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.